What a joy it is to welcome you to New Salem Baptist Church. Whether you're with us in person or watching from the live stream today, I hope and prayer is that we'll say something or do something that'll bless your heart. It's a special day in the life of our church. We're going to honor our graduates here in just a few minutes, and I'm awful proud of every one of them. But in the meantime, we want to sing all four stanzas of a classic from church growing up. I'm pressing on the higher ground. Stand to your feet. Welcome. Let's worship. It's good to have you with us today. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day still praying as I onward bound Lord plant my feet on higher ground Lord lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land a higher plane than I have found Lord plant my feet on higher ground Dismay, though some may dwell where those abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on To scale the utmost high and catch a gleam of glory bright, but still I'll pray till heaven I found my lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane. Sing that chorus. Sing that chorus one more time. Lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask His blessing on our time together. Heavenly Father, I give you praise and glory, Lord, for the blessing that you saw fit to pour into my life. Lord, I thank you for safe travels. Lord, I thank you for healing that you've brought into the lives of some that are gathered here this morning. Lord, we've got some folks here today that are feeling a whole lot better than they felt last Sunday. We give you praise for that. Father, we thank you for those that are watching from home via the live stream, and I hope and pray, God, that you'll go right where they are. Lord, with the sweet moving of your spirit, Lord, right into their lives, they're in the living room or at work or wherever they're watching. I pray, God, that you'll let the, the sweet spirit of God make its way even through the internet. Our songs and the preaching will be a blessing and lift their spirits wherever they find themselves. And Father, you know the worries and cares that lay heavy on our heart and mind this morning. I do ask a blessing, Father, on Bob St. John's. He goes for his surgery this coming Wednesday. I pray, God, you'll bless those doctors and nurses and everyone involved in that procedure. Lord, I thank our brother Steve Cutshaw this morning, Father, that's awful sick as well. And, God, he needs a touch. He needs a healing touch that only you can provide. And we're going to trust you for that. And I know his family well enough. I know this church family. We'll give you glory in advance, and we'll praise you for what you're going to do for them. So bless this service. Everything that we say, everything that we do, let it bring glory to your high name today. Receive all that we say. And all that we do, the very thoughts of our mind, the meditations of our lips, Lord, let them be found acceptable in your sight and our simple way of trying to sing glory to your name. So take all that we do, use it for your glory. Bless these folks that are gathered here this morning. And I'll gladly praise you for all you do with us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.
But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to Thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to Thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Our depths of love that I cannot know till I cross the narrow sea. There are heights of joy that I may not reach till I rest in peace with Thee. So draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord. My precious bleeding side. Amen. Praise the good Lord. You may be seated. Amen. Again, let me welcome you to New Salem this morning. If this is your first time or the first time in a long time, we're going to settle into the presence of the Lord and, and just ask His blessing on our time together. I'm going to take just about this much time. I've got a couple of very timely announcements I need to put in front of you. Uh, first one I want to mention to you is regarding our Vacation Bible School. Uh, vacation Bible School actually starts a week from tomorrow. Uh, and Miss Pam Duggar is our Vacation Bible School director. I want you to come up here and join me on the stage, Miss Pam. Grab one of these microphones and uh, a couple, couple of, uh, of needs that, that we need help with. So you come up here with me. Man, again, we started, it starts next, a week from tomorrow in the nighttime. So this is a, a little bit of a change from norm for us. Uh, we've done it in the nighttime. We've done it in the daytime. And ups and downs and some folks like better we're not please everybody no matter how hard we try but it's going to be at six o'clock six to eight p.m there's classes for kiddos from three years old all the way through and including the 12th grade um so uh you need to get them here most of them kids can't drive themselves they probably could but they shouldn't especially the four-year-olds they you know we kind of frown on that around here but there's a couple of very pending needs a week a week to go that we still need help with right if you look in your bulletin, there is a blurb in there about needing snacks. Uh, this year we're asking for snacks that are like individual size, like Capri Suns, Kool-Aid Jammers, stuff like that, and just individual pack like cookies or crackers so the teachers can take them back to their classroom. It's a little less messy uh, to distribute it to the kids. So that's the first need. The second need, or second and third need, I guess, I'm in need of... And I'm not going to do what I did in first service and make it uh, sexist here. So I'm just going to say I'm in need of like shovels, pickaxes, any type of something that you may have at your house that you would think they might use in an archaeological dig. Uh, because that's what the theme is, is archaeological dig. And I'm also in need of rolling pins for the craft that we are doing. So if any of you all have any of those things, would like to donate anything, just for the week, we'll give it back. Uh, please bring them by next Sunday. So, and if anybody has not signed up and you just want to come and hang out and come and work or, or you know, just chip in wherever you're needed, you are more than welcome to do that. All right, beautiful. That's Monday through Friday, not tomorrow, but next week. Starts on Memorial Day, 6 to 8 p.m., and there's plenty of room for your kiddos, and we've got some other volunteers you can come be a part as well, so we can sure use the help. Thank you, Pam, and uh, be much in prayer. Make that a, a, a high on your priority list of things you're praying for, that God will just bless um, through Vacation Bible School. And the last thing I want to mention announcement-wise, there's only one more Sunday uh, before our, we're going to wrap up our, our Bible drive. We're, we're collecting Bibles. 
that we're going to be sending to missionaries and churches all over the world, literally through an agency that we've come in contact with. Uh, Jim Ward has been working hard to collect Sunday school literature and material. We're, we're going to have a pile of stuff from our church. That's exciting. Our box is already full, and there's actually we've already pulled a few out of that box. So there's actually boxes that came out of that. So that's when you see the blue toad out there, that's not all we've collected. So uh, one more week. Next Sunday will be the last day to collect our Bibles. Next Saturday, this is one announcement that's not in your bullet. I just about forgot. But next Saturday at 8 o'clock here at the New Salem Cemetery, we'll be having our, our flags in ceremony. It's where we recognize all of our veterans. Not ever the veteran laying out there uh, died in service to the country, but we do have a few that did. So if you've never actually been here, and let me introduce you to our veterans that are, that are laying at rest in our cemetery. Uh, we, we put flags in all of their, their graves and honor them and their memory on Sunday and again into Monday being Memorial Day. So that's Saturday at 8 o'clock. If you want to come be a part of that, we'd love to have you right here at the New Salem Cemetery. Rain or shine, I will add that. Uh, it rains on just about every year we do it, it seems like. But we'll do that this year, rain or shine. 8 o'clock next Saturday uh, right here at the church. Amen. I want to... Uh, move forward to a to a, a, a special moment in the life of, of well every church but I, I don't go to every church I go to New Salem Church so it's a very special day in the life of our church and we've got we've got six uh, young men and women that graduated high school this weekend uh, they couldn't all be with us this morning uh, a few of you know Leland Willis uh, Leland uh, couldn't be with us today because of a scheduling conflict but we're going to recognize five of them and the way we're going to do this, I'm going to let you keep your seats. I'm not going to make you stand up here and stand in, in front of me or anything, but I'm going to be making eye contact because I know, I know where you all are, are sitting. Um, but I, I, want to, I want to read uh, something into your life that, that, that God blessed me to write, and, uh, and, I, and I hope it will be um, a challenge to you um, because I've, I've been where your mom and dad are. Uh, my son graduated. Uh, I always have to ask again, Miss Tammy. He was 11, and Rachel was in, in 7. She said 7 11. It's easy to remember, but honestly, I, I could not remember. 7 11. Yeah, how hard is that? 7 and 11. So I, I've been where your parents are, and, and I've been where you are. I, I said and listened to my pastor uh, speak words into my life on the weekend that I graduated. Uh, your mom and dad have been doing a lot of, of reflecting and, and remembering over the past few days. Uh, they've posted embarrassing pictures of you on their social media page of you as, as babies and, and kiddos. Uh, they're remembering the day you were born. They're remembering the day that you went off to school. And uh, some of them can even remember the first loose tooth that you lost, all those memories. But that's the way our life is. Our life is, is a collection of, 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 of events and, and occasions, most of them joyous, a lot of them not so much. There's moments of sadness. That's all part of our lives every day. And this weekend marks one of the high water marks. This is, this is one of the good ones that we all hang on to. Um, some of you are already thinking about what's going to happen next. Some of you are already thinking about the next step. It's going to be school or it's going to be work or a little bit of both, a combination of both. Um, you're, you're not going to believe it now, but again, I've been where you are. You may not remember it, but in the years to come, you're, you're going to look back on these days and long for these days. I saw a Facebook meme just yesterday that we're, that we're celebrating these graduations and we're celebrating the easiest time of your life. <laughs> the easiest time of your life is now over. And, and I, I wish I had uh, more encouraging things to say, but now it gets real. Uh, in a lot of ways, up until now, walking for you has, has consisted in uh, just making circles around the living room. That's why we all learned to walk, hanging on to the coffee table, hanging on to the couch with mom and dad there to, to pick us up when you fail. But starting now, things will be changing. The time will come when you have to venture outside. You have to walk away from the coffee table and the couch and walk on your own. You have to walk into the, draw, into the yard and, and then into the driveway and eventually, you know, other places. And beginning right now, you're going to begin testing the bounds of this newfound freedom and this newfound independence. Kind of like the first time you walk out into the yard, mom and dad will still be there. They might be hiding in the bushes and waiting to pick you up when you fall. But it's a blessing to know that they're still there. You may not have to be picked up every time, as often, but knowing that they're still there will give you that that you need to go on. So I feel led of the Lord to speak into your life this morning to our graduates what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 7, that we don't walk by faith. We, we walk by faith and not by sight. 
So the very idea that we can put our trust in the Lord is what's going to get us through those challenges still um, awaiting you. In just a minute, I'm going to present in your hands a card. And on the back of that card is, is a little bookmark that I made with you in mind. And what I did, I borrowed a slogan from the U.S. Army's 3rd Battalion, 290th Infantry Battalion, who, um, who braved crazy, crazy combat action in Belgium and in France in World War II. And that brave group of fighting men adopted as their motto a French phrase, toujours in avant. And I probably mutilated it because I don't speak French. But it simply translates as always forward. Always forward. To those, those group of fighting men, uh, they were always moving forward. They had a reputation of engaging the enemy before anybody else did. The idea of moving forward always involves stepping. You're never going to move forward until you take that first step. There was a wise man that said a journey of a thousand miles that begins with a single step. And today you're going to take that first step into this brand new journey. And I leave you with these words from the Apostle Paul from Philippians chapter 3 verse 14. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. No matter what this journey may hold for you, class of 2022, you keep stepping. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct thy paths. To yours in avant, always forward, always forward, always stepping. I want to recognize our graduates this morning. Brother Tim is going to join me on the stage and has a presentation to make to you. There's a card uh, from the church, and also attached to that is a card from your WMU. The ladies of our church uh, worked hard to put all these cards together. And what I'd love for you to do is, as I call your name, if you can come up on this side for Brother Tim and just sort of line up along the stage. There's just, there's just five of us, so there's plenty of room. And then uh, someone might grab a picture, and uh, I'd love somebody to get a picture of me and Tim with these graduates. And then um, Brother Tim's going to have a, a word of prayer uh, for the class of 2022. Amen. Alyssa Lynn Abbott. <laughs> Alyssa graduated from Heritage Home Scholars there in Greenville and will be moving in the fall uh, and become a, a resident down at Carson Newman. And we wish her all the best. She'll be studying religious studies and missions. So I'll uh, be much in prayer for Alyssa as she heads off to um, Carson Newman. Ethan Bradley Gillis. Ethan graduated from David Crockett High School yesterday over at the ETSU Mini Dome. What a day we had of celebration there. And Ethan is uh, moving forward and looking forward to his next step in life. And we're proud of, of Ethan. Grayson Alexander James. Grayson also was part of the class of 2022 from David Crockett High School. And I had the privilege of standing on the platform with these boys yesterday and reading all their names. Uh, and I don't, I don't think I messed theirs up. There was a couple that I did mess up, but thankfully theirs is easy to say. So I think I, think I got theirs right. Zachary Dalton Miller. Again, a graduate of David Crockett High School. We're thankful that God saw fit to bring the Millers to our church. And they've been a, a welcome addition. I'm anxious to see their, their girls grow up and the boys. And we'll, we'll see at their graduations too before long. <laughs> It'll be there before we know it. And lastly, to, to break the, the, the David Crockett High School um, streak, it just happened to be in alphabetical order, not because we grouped them by school, but doing alphabetical order. Cameron Blake Wilhoyt. Cameron graduated uh, Friday night from West Green High School. And uh, I had to apologize to his mom and dad. Their, their announcement showed at my house Friday afternoon in the mail. And it said, it's tonight. It was, it, the, the things was postmarked. Cam, you ain't heard this story. They were postmarked three times. It had been run through the thing three times, three different dates, finally before they made it to my house. So we were, we were there in spirit, man. I apologize it didn't get to me in time. So this is the class of 2022. Give them another big hand. Yeah. All right. Good deal. Now, 
Can you get one with all of them? You stay on this end, I'll get on the other end. Yeah, you should have stood over here. That way up. Oh, well. They're <laughs> oh, still flashing. All right, Brother Tim, take this class of 22 to the Lord and ask their bless, God's blessing on their life. Will do. You know, you had me worried at first when you were talking about hiding in the bushes and watching them fall. I'm like, no, you stand up there with them and push them down. I'm like, where are you going with this, Greg? You, you, you know, like, how, how, life's awful. You know, good luck. You graduated. Life's awful. But, but you did bring it back. Um, hey, Mary Beth, come on up with us. Yep, come on up. Mary yep. Beth's visiting with us. She graduated also, so we're going to pray for you too. So come on up. thought you could hide come on she said she likes to hide I know. He's okay. thank you Sorry. Tim that was Guys, very appropriate let's pray father we love you um, so many things in our life that we just point to you and 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 understand where you've had a hand in it and Lord I just know that as these guys step out it's a different life. It's a different world. It's a different routine. And Father, I know that you've got a path in store for them. And I just pray that you'll shine a little bit of light on that and help them to understand that path and understand that they need to seek you and look for you to show them that path. Lord, I just pray that you'll protect them, that you'll go before them as we know you are right now, that you'll go before them and just lay down that groundwork. And Lord, you'll just be there with them every step even with all the highs and lows Lord help them to understand you're always there you don't move and Father I just pray that you be with the families be with the church this is just a different step for them we're still there for them we're still there with them every day uh, and Father I just pray that great things for them because I know that you have great things in store for them All right. and Father let us never forget of who you are and what you've done for us and how important the cross is to us no matter what life has in store. Father, again, we love you and we thank you. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Give another big hand. All right, guys, you can be seated. While the team comes back around and prepares for our next song, we send this one out and dedication to our graduates. <clears throat> last week, in last week's message, I made a passing reference to a song, a line in a song, that at the end of every day, God grant that our lives could be such that he would sign his name to the end of our day. In other words, approving of all the decisions that we made and the steps that we made and the things that we did for his glory. So to our graduates, uh, we dedicate this song this morning. The simple, simple but powerful line is, the very, the, the very thought behind this song is, is regardless of what I face, let the way that I live my life bring glory to you. So pray for the ladies as they lead us in the next song.
I want to say as an introduction to this last song this morning how thankful I am for these kids. Um, I'm thankful that I had the privilege to watch them grow up. We were doing some math yesterday, and uh, I've, I've been here 19 years. It'll be 19 years in August. Um, so I was, I, was, I was there when they were born. I've been around them all their life, and that just, that just sort of um, blesses my heart to think about. And I'm thankful that, uh, contrary to what the world might try to tell you, the world don't have all their hearts and minds. There's still some, some godly young'uns out there that are striving to do all that they can do for the glory of God. Bob St. John shared a link with me just this morning of, of the valedictorian over at Boone's graduation yesterday. Stepped up to that microphone there at the ETSU Mini Dome with all of his, friend, his peers in front of him and all them parents and friends filling up those stands at ETSU's Mini Dome. Bold as any preacher I've ever seen in my life, stood and preached Jesus on the platform of that graduation. Told him without apology, Brother Darrell said, if you want all the things of this world, he said, you seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and God will add all this other stuff into you. Seek this day who you're going to serve, he said. And I was just so proud of him. I, I rewound it and watched it two or three times. If you want to watch it, I'll, I'll gladly text you the link. But that blessed my heart. Because I know that some of you are going to walk out into this crazy, mixed-up world and it's going to be overwhelming to you at times. Many of you this morning are facing circumstances of life where you're feeling overwhelmed. Sickness in your family or medical worries or financial worries and relationships that are under attack. And there's so many things and so much stuff that God's people has to put up with. Ann brought this song to us a month or two ago and has, has quickly become her kind of her signature song. She does it better than any of us because it comes from her heart. And wherever you find yourself this morning, whatever you're facing in life, whatever life's circumstances may look like to you, this song has a simple idea. Hold on to me. I can't, I can't do this by myself. When the, when, the, when the best I've got is not nearly good enough, hold on to me. And you sing, sing your song for it. Let this song do, do work. It'll, it'll minister to you. We're praying it'll help you this morning. Let Ann sing this good song for you this morning. When the best of me is barely breathing When I'm not somebody I believe in Hold on to me When I miss the light the night has stolen When I'm slamming all the doors
Amen. I love that line. He has to be right. He's God. Amen. Don't, don't believe the, own, the hype that everybody tries to tell you about your life. I think that's why that song means so much to me. Now, I'm so thankful that God knows me uh, better than I know my own self. And I'm thankful for that this morning. Amen. While you're settling in, I'm, I'm going to laugh at uh, Ivan just for a minute. He made me chuckle. You, did you notice that? He's sitting there with his family. Mom and dad's on this one, and the whole other end of the pew is, 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 is empty. He, he leaves to go get to the bathroom and go drink. He climbs over mom and dad. It goes all the way out this way when the whole other half of the pew is in. I thought that, was just, that just sort of made me chuckle. I said, classic, classic. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 6 is our focal text for today. There are probably several verses of Scripture that I could throw at you that you probably would never thought would be in the book of Jeremiah. Uh, verses that we've all heard preached and quoted in, in various uh, capacities. Um, and our text for today is a good example of that. In fact, I would go so far as to say, uh, Brother Darrell, I've, I've heard Jeremiah 6.16 used in a lot of ways I didn't necessarily agree with. I think sometimes it's been interpreted, uh, it's preached and quoted, uh, where they've used it as a, as, a, as, a, as a call to a specific movement in their church, uh, and, uh, and to be honest, I've, I've said under some mighty fine preachers that I'm, I've, I've almost kind of got myself convinced in my own understanding of what this verse is all about that they didn't use it in its proper context. And I, I would say that with if, if they were sitting here in front of me. You know, some of them are family members. Um, with all that being said, I want you to listen to Jeremiah 6, verse number 16. I'll be reading from the New American Standard translation of Scripture this morning, and it'll read just a little bit different from King James, but not a lot. It says it this way, verse 16 of Jeremiah chapter 6, Thus says the Lord, Stand by the ways and see, and ask for the ancient paths. I know right there King James says old paths. And you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk in it. Father, I thank you for this word I thank you for the message you've laid on my heart for this day. And, Father, I pray that just not, our, not just our graduates, Father, but, but, but everyone hearing this message this morning, be in the room or watching from home, will be challenged the way I was when you showed it to me. Father, use me for your glory, and I'll praise you for it all. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen and amen. I want to begin this morning with an illustration that, that's it's going to fall on deaf ears for some of you. A handful of you will get it, and that's okay, because for those of you that don't get it right away, I'll coach you through it. Uh, did anybody besides me see all three of the Back to the Future movies? Anybody else a big Back to the Future fan besides me? Okay. For the rest of you, I'll help you. Let me help you right, right about here. Uh, there's three movies, uh, and Marty McFly is, is the star in all three of these, played by Michael J. Fox. Marty McFly has the privilege of having access to a time machine. Uh, Dr. Emmett Brown took a, a DeLorean, the classic-looking car from the 80s with them winged doors on the side, and turned that DeLorean into a time machine that was powered by the... I knew somebody, nobody in the 9 o'clock service could pull it out. Thank you. I stood up, I thought for sure somebody would know it was powered by the flux capacitor. Yeah, you can tell, you can tell the real fans in the house. Well, in the first movie... Marty accidentally travels back to 1955. And he's stranded in 1955 due to a lack of plutonium. Uh, Dr. Brown had built this plutonium-driven flux, flux capacitor, and that's what powered the time machine. So without plutonium, he's stuck in 1955. Well, in the third movie, he travels even further back to, to 1885. Now he's stranded in 1885 because of a lack of gasoline to power the car. So they had to get the car up to a particular speed. I'm not going to, you probably know that speed. How fast did they have to go, Jerry? Was it 80, 80 miles an hour? I forget how far. I think it was 80. 88 miles per hour. There are some other fans in the house. Well, here, here's, here's what I took away from that movie. And, 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 and honestly, it really fits well with Jeremiah 6:16. There was a key theme that, that spanned all three of those movies, and it's this. That if I'm going to fix the present, if I'm going to fix what I'm going on right now in the present time, the only way to fix the present is to recreate the system 
and follow the same principles that led to success in the first place. Now, we'll come back and we'll revisit that here in just a minute, but I promise you it'll make sense before we're done. The very simple before us this morning, Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16, speaks to that very idea. Stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths. Ask, walk, and rest is the title of this morning's message. Now, I've told you before at the beginning of this message that I've, I've heard this verse of Scripture used by many, many dear pastors and, and brothers in the Lord as a call to return. I've heard it preached everything from that it, it, it's a call back to a certain type of music or, or, or a certain worship style or sometimes even a, a certain Bible translation that we need to, that, that there's only one, you know, 1611 King James Version, which I love dearly, but you can't say that's the old paths because if you're going to say that, then you have to go back even further to the Bishop's Bible. So there's actually one older than the KJV. So that, that can't be the answer. Now, and again, there, there is a certain element of, of that truth in this verse. Don't get me wrong. But I'm just convinced that this call by this man of God goes a whole, whole lot deeper than the outward trappings of just worship style and the outward trappings of the way that we do business in everyday living here in church. There's a song that, that shows up in the countless hymn books. I don't think it's in this particular Baptist hymnal. Uh, but there, there is one that has become a piece of Americana and American religious activity in America, <laughs> even though it says nothing about Jesus in it. It don't say anything about the power of the gospel. I'm talking about that classic American song, Give Me That Old Time Religion. Give me, all those verses. It was good for Paul and Silas. It, it, it was good for mom and dad. It'll take us all to heaven. Great, great song talking about the power of religion. Give me the old time. Nothing about Jesus, nothing about the power of the gospel. And when you stop and consider that that classic American song dates all the way back to 1873, then the question begins to bounce around in your noggin, what exactly does old time religion look like? The, the best example I've ever saw of this idea is when we had Old Fashioned Day here at the church. The first time we observed Old Fashioned Day here at the church. And my daughter Rachel's idea, Old Fashioned, was bell bottoms and tie-dyed shirts. Old Fashioned. Some of you can think of, of fashions in the 80s or fashioned in, that's Old Fashioned. But, uh, but the older you get, the difference Old Fashioned looks. But here's the point of my message this morning. There is indeed going on around us very prevalent in our society that we live, there is, a, there is a shift that's occurring with what our modern society knows of religion. The, the word is used differently than it's ever been used before. Uh, and the word is, is as vast and, and endless in its application in the way that we do things in big churches, little churches, all across this nation of ours. But here's what I've come to observe in my 57 years on this planet Religion today offers very little substance that would actually change the hearts of sin sick people. Religious practices of today is, 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 consists of, of shouts of, of tolerance, and, and it seems to lend itself more towards uh, entertainment and, and gathering folks into big uh, former NBA arenas with your pastor's got a big smile on his face and his book plastered all across the pages and then preaching out, of, you know who I'm talking. That, the religious activities in this world has this weird shift and God instructs the nation of Israel, these folks was handpicked to be his chosen people. He instructs them to seek out the old path. He's telling them to seek out those things that blessed you in the past. Those places that you found success in the past. Paths of godliness and paths of righteousness. So the man of God speaks to the people of God. And basically like we sang this morning, let my life song be in you. What he's basically telling us that there has to be, church, there has to be a practical application of the faith that we profess with our mouth, it has to be apparent in our everyday lives. Go back to the old paths, Jeremiah says. Thus says the Lord, stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths. So let me, let me take all that introduction and summarize it into these three points. First of all, somewhere around 627 B.C., God speaks through Jeremiah and tells Israel, seek out the old paths and walk in them and you'll find rest. 
You fast forward to 1873 in a camp meeting close to Lexington, South Carolina, a dude by the name of Charles Davis Tillman hears for the first time a black spiritual, give me that old time religion, and he publishes it in 1889, and it takes a permanent place in the fabric of religion in America. Fast forward again to 2022, when pastors all across this great land of ours are taking this same verse of Scripture and calling for the old past, using those words of Jeremiah. So here's, here's the dilemma that I found myself in. The question is, how could they all be talking about the same old paths? How could Jeremiah call the nation of Israel to old paths? 1800s, give me that old-time religion, and now preachers today. How, how, there has to be a common factor between these periods of time. There has to be more on the table than preaching style and music style and the way we're dressing and, and the, the things of that, that we uh, use this verse to try to call people back to the old style. So what could we possibly have in common today with the folks in Jeremiah's day? You may be surprised to know there's actually more than you think. There's actually more in common than you may actually know from the very surface. I want you to come with me to 1 Kings chapter number 12. And I want to propose to you this morning that the old paths that Jeremiah uh, was calling for could very likely have been diverted by what happens in 1 Kings chapter number 12. It could be rightly argued that Israel's venture off the old paths started right here in the reign of Jeroboam. Let me read this passage for you. Chapter 12, verse 25 of 1 Kings. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there, and he went out from there and built Penuel. Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom will return to the house of David. If this people go up to offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will return to the Lord, even to Rehoboam, the king of Judah, and they'll kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. A little bit worried about his, his position. So he says this. So the king consulted and made two golden calves. He said to them, It's too much for you to have to go all the way to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, that brought you up from the land of Egypt. He set one of those, those golden calves. He set one in Bethel, and the other one he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one as far as Dan. And he made houses on high places and made priests from among all the people who were not of the sons of Levi. Key phrase, not of the sons of Levi. God already said, all your high priests, they're going to come out of the house of Levi. Jeroboam said, nah. Jeroboam also instituted a feast. This is verse 32. Instituted a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month like the feast which is in Judah. And he went up to the altar, thus he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves which he had made. And he stationed in Bethel the priest of the high places which he had made. Then he went up to the altar which he had made in Bethel on the 15th day in the 18th month, even in the month which he had devised in his own heart. And he instituted a feast for the sons of Israel and went up to the altar to burn incense. Preacher, what's that got to do with where I'm living today? Well, hang on. Don't jump ahead of me. Those actions by, by King Jeroboam were in essence a complete pollution and a corruption of the house of God. You have total rejection and rebellion against the things that God has said. This is the way we're going to do business. When it comes time to do sacrifices, when it comes time to doing business in the presence of a, of a high and a holy God, this is the way you're going to do things. Well, Jeroboam says, well, I got something better in mind. So he brought about this new way. He created and devised this, this convenience. It was, a, it was a religion of convenience. You don't have to go all the way up yonder to Jerusalem. We'll build us a couple little golden calves. You can sacrifice here. You can come throw a few offerings and a few sacrifices at that golden calf and, and move on about your day. Back of their mind, they had to be remembering, God says, thou shalt not worship any graven image or worship any other god. The command from God was clear, meaning that this worship that they're now being under King Jeroboam is completely false. So Jeroboam polluted the, the priesthood. He took those men that he thought would make good king or make good priests, <laughs> put them behind the pulpit. Brother Darrell didn't have the credentials, didn't have God's back, and didn't have a touch of God on them in any shape, form, or fashion. He handpicked them, chose them by himself, and threw them into the temples and said, here's what I want you to do. You're going to perform the sacrifices, and we're going to make this thing a little bit more convenient for all of us. That's the new way. 
That's what Jeroboam introduced. Now we fast forward back to our text in Jeremiah that I read in your hearing this morning. That word came from God via Jeremiah to the people that was responsible for those kind of choices. And his message is very clear. They were responsible. You've got to know the truth for yourself. Don't be deceived by those false priests. Don't fall into that foolishness that Jeroboam has presented to you. He says, you're going to have to go back to the old past. You're going to have to go back to that that I ordained in my word through the Mosaic law. And begin, hopefully now you're starting to see how the church of today is not that different at all from God's people here in the Old Testament. Because we've done the same thing. We've created this, this sense of, of religious practices that don't, that don't have the touch of God within 10 miles. You know, the Bible says Solomon was so in, empowered by the Spirit of God, he says the same thing in two different places. If you're taking notes, you ought to jot down Proverbs 14, 12 and Proverbs 16, 25. Because both of those verses are identical, word for word, where the wisest man that ever lived says, there is a way which seems right unto man, but the end thereof is the ways of death. Has to be important for Scripture to hold it not once but twice, verb, verbatim, word for word. There is a way that seems right unto man, and that's where we find ourselves in our society today. Jeremiah is not just suggesting doing the old things. or He's not suggesting doing things at all, really. He's speaking of recovering those successful principles. He's telling the people of God right here, says, listen, you need to go back before Jeroboam. You need to remember how it was to worship God. You went to the temple and you offered up burnt offerings to the Lord as the Lord himself had determined it would happen. That's the old past that Jeremiah is talking about. Those successful principles that allowed us as the people of God to be successful and do great things in the, in the past, in the days gone by of our country and of our people and of our worship style. So see, old-time religion still has some very important ties to the old paths that Jeremiah is talking about. The old paths are simply the foundation of those things that we've known have worked in the past. Those things that we know brought power to the church, brought power to the people of God when we're obedient to what God's called us to be. The old paths are built on a foundation that modern-day religion would rather just drop by the wayside. See, there's a whole lot of, 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 of smarter men than me claiming to be smarter men than me and, and, and more dynamic and, 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 and prettier men than me and fancier suits than me and more jet airplanes than I have standing before a lot bigger crowds that this kind of preaching will not fall on their kind of receptive ears because modern-day religion would rather drop these six things I'm about to give you, just drop them by the wayside. There's no place for them in our modern worship style, in our modern religion. I'm going to give you what this pastor has come to interpret as the old past. Here's what I believe Jeremiah has to speak in our lives today. Keeping in mind that Marty McFly example, if I'm going to use, if I'm going to find success where I'm at right now, there's some got to get back and find those things that's worked before, and it'll work still today. Let me give them to you very, very rapidly. The old past, first of all, will always build on the power and the authority of the Word of God. Period. First, Second Chronicles chapter 34, verses 8 and following, there's a great story that I've used in a, in a lot of different applications. It's the, it's the story that comes from the reign of righteous King Josiah. There was, there was, there was a bunch of, of, of kings in Judah that were slugs and thugs and, 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 and just knuckleheads. But there's some righteous kings, some men that did, did what was right in the eyes of God. And Josiah is one of those. Well, renovations are being done to the temple. And during those times of renovation, they stumbled across a copy of the Torah. Now, here's what that would mean. It would be like us going back in one of these little ante rooms, and we're cleaning out, having spring cleaning, Miss Sandy, and we're getting rid of a bunch of stuff, and some, we stumble across a copy of the Bible. And somebody says, well, there's the Bible. I remember Grandma used to read that Bible. I remember the preacher used to preach out of that. That's, in essence, what's happened Right here, during these renovations, the Bible says in verse 14 of, of 2 Chronicles 38, the book of the law given by the Lord to Moses. What tells, this story tells us is God's people had become so preoccupied in following after the practices of this world and worshiping after their pagan gods, not only did they ignore the word of God, they had physically lost it. 
They stumbled across a copy of the Torah, and it, and it so impressed the heart of the king, the Bible says, he was so convicted that he ripped his clothes, the Bible says in verse number 19, because he knew the people had broken every command in the book of the law, and judgment was about to follow. I read that story, and it blows my mind, because the first thing I'm thinking, under what authority, Hil Hilkiah was the high priest at the time, what authority is he acting under? What kind of activities were they doing in the temple day in and day out, day in and day out? And the Word of God wasn't even a centerpiece, a forefront in their worship activities. God help us if we ever get to the place in this country where the Bible takes second place to what the pastor wrote or second place to what's going on in current events or what I'm reading, what I'm reading on social media. This book has got to hold a, 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 a center place in all that we do here. Paul said in Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 8, said, Though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, and that's been preached unto you, let him be accursed. So the first old path is the simple power and authority of the word of God. Number two, the old path will always involve people confessing and repenting of their sin. That right there flies in the face of modern day religiosity in this world. When the Bible says very clearly, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Psalm 38 verse 18 says, I will declare my iniquity and I'll be sorry for my sin. Listen to me, the preacher, when I tell you that, that confession and repentance still works. If you're in a place in your life this morning where you're not as spiritually close to the Lord as you used to be, you need to check yourself because God hasn't moved. It's very likely the sin of your own life, the unconfessed sin in your life that's driven a wedge between you and your heavenly Father. He said, you, you come back to the old paths. Stand in the old paths and, you know, where the good way is and walk in it. I'm talking about the power and the authority of the Word of God. People confessing and repenting of their sins. Number three, the old paths will always see people humbling themselves before God in prayer. Prayer still works. Prayer still mends broken families. Prayer still heals. God has entrusted his presence and his power to the shoulders of men and women that are willing to just simply pray. James chapter 5 verse 16 says, The effectual fervent prayers of righteous people <laughs> can do great things. I'm going to stand before you with every bone in my body telling you how proud I am of what God is doing in the life of New Salem Church. I'm thankful for the new faces that we're seeing on a regular basis. I'm thankful that we got to operate and do a, a new members class in the middle of a pandemic when a lot of churches were shutting down. I praise God for that. But I'm going to tell you with everything in my being this morning, the only reason, the only reason that happens is because there is a core of committed people that gathers every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock in that fellowship hall and prays for this church and prays for their pastor. The ladies meet every Tuesday morning and prays for the ministries of this church. God will hear the prayers of the God's people when we begin to lift our voices. He's still in, in a prayer-answering business. God's work on this planet, God's work in this church is dependent upon the prayers and the intercession of folks like us. Number four, the Bible always, or the old paths will always include sound biblical preaching. Again, that's old paths. That's old school. I actually had a dude tell me one time, he says, you boys that preach Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, you boys are about like dinosaurs. That was the exact word he used. These preachers that preach more than one time a week in their church. A, if you preach more than Sunday morning at your church, you guys are dinosaurs. That just don't happen anymore. But I'd have to go back to where the Bible tells me that uh, it's just through the foolishness of preaching. One old man took, interpreted that as the foolishness of preachers. Sometimes that's true, too. Sometimes it's foolishness of preachers. But the preaching of the cross is to them that are perishing foolishness. But them that are being saved, it's the power of God. We live in a day that the Apostle Paul, he wasn't a prophet, but he nailed it when he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse number 3, he said, Timothy, you mark my words. He said, there's going to be a time coming. They'll not endure sound doctrine. They'll, they'll, they'll go after their own lust, heaping to themselves teachers, having itching ears. You know, I'm talking the truth this morning. I tell you that there are some boys in this country that have got great followers, tens of thousands of people following after them, but don't have enough God on them to get them out of the rain. Don't have enough God in their preaching, changing lives supposedly, but it's a social gospel in their preaching that they don't want to the tickling their ears, tickling cymbal and sounding brass if you don't have the power of God on them. The old paths will also be built on a total provision on the, the, or their total dependence on the provision of God. God help us if we ever get to the place where we recognize 
or fail to recognize his blessing on our lives. God's still calling for, for folks like us to make sacrificial decisions. He's still calling us to sacrifice and self-denial, waiting upon him in complete dependence, coming to the place that we can sing like we sang this morning. Father, if you don't move, if you don't heal, if you don't fix this relationship, if you don't provide financially, there's no answer outside of you. There has to be a moment that I completely sell out in total dependence on the provision of Almighty God. And then lastly, old-time religion, the old paths will always be built on people being saved by grace through faith. Hasn't changed. Doesn't, doesn't ring loudly in this modern day. The whole idea of the, of the cross and the sacrifice of the blood of Jesus is a little disturbing to folks, a little too bloody for my taste, a little bit too bloody for my liking. But the simple truth is that God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead and our transgressions made us alive with Christ. For by grace you have been saved. Not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, so that no one has anything to boast about. So there's very quickly six things. Six things right there, a very small little succinct list. The old paths will always be built on the power and the authority of the Word of God. Nothing's going to change that. People confessing and repenting of their sins humbling themselves to God in prayer, solid biblical preaching, a total dependence on the provision of God, and lastly being saved by grace through faith. I'm talking about getting back to the place of what Jeremiah said. That Back to the Future movies introduced a theme, I believe, that Jeremiah introduced way before the movies was ever developed. If you're going to fix the problem, if you want to fix the present situation that you're in, you're going to have to recreate the system and follow those same principles. Every one of those stories had, had the same basic thing. Marty was missing home. <laughs> Marty wanted to get back to his girlfriend. Marty wanted to get back to that cool truck that he left behind. He, he missed his life. 1885, he wanted to get back. 1955, he wanted to get back home. He wanted to get back to where he used to be. Because he missed that place. He missed the comforts of home. He missed the comforts of his girlfriend and the life that he had left back in 19, whatever it was, 85, I guess. And I got to thinking about that this morning. And the Lord gave me a whole different direction for the way I would close this message. Because many of you can speak to that. There's a place in your life where you recognize you're not it's where you ought to be spiritually. You're living in a, in, a, in a backslidden condition. And you know there was a time in your life when you were closer to the Lord than you are now. And you know that that's where you need to be, where you ought to be, where God would have you to be. But you find yourself separated from where you know you ought to be. And it's our own choices that have put us there, quite honestly. Because if you're living in a backslidden condition, you're not where you want to be, you're not where you used to be in your walk with the Lord, you realize that God hasn't moved. God hasn't changed. This separation has happened because of the choices and the decisions that each of us have made. So just as surely as Marty McFly wants to get back to his modern day that he knew and the time that he loved, he recognized back here that there's going to be some things I'm going to have to recreate. We've got to figure out how to get that car up to, what, 88. We've got to figure out a way to get that. It may take a train. It may take dynamite sticking out the bottom of that thing, but we've got to get this thing up to 88 miles an hour for us to get back to where we need to be. We may have to steal some plutonium. Or we may have to use a lightning bolt out of heaven to power that flux capacitor. But I've, hmm, I've got a desire to be back where I know I'm supposed to be. I'm destined to be here. This is where I'm supposed to be. And everything I need to do to get me back to this place, I'm willing to take those steps. This is advice that was originally intended for Israel of old. It's a word that speaks loudly to the church today, but it's a message that our very modern ear doesn't want to hear. Jeremiah would say to the church today, if he was to step into where we're at today, what principles made you successful in the past? What's different today? If that's where you want to be and you were closer to the Lord and you felt his conviction in your life and his spirit drawing you and the power in you, what's changed? Maybe you're not praying like you used to. Maybe you're not reading God's Word like you used to or testifying and sharing your faith with people like you ought to be doing. Because I promise you, He hasn't moved. The position that you want to be in is still just as valid and very valid as it is right now. God still stands, coming to me, all you that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. 
So any separation that pushes you outside where you can't only hear his, hear his voice or feel his presence in your life and his arms of compassion surrounding you, if you feel separated, if you feel distanced, if you feel removed from that that you used to be, that that you used to feel, that place that you used to live in spiritually, tell me that the problem is not ours. Don't try to tell me that the problem is God has changed. Wherever you are in your journey of faith. Maybe you just graduated high school. Maybe you can barely remember high school. <laughs> Maybe you've not made it to high school yet. Wherever you are on this journey of life that you are on this journey of faith, the word is still valid. You stand in these ways and see. You ask for the old paths where the good way walk therein. And you'll find rest. Ask, walk, and you'll find rest. Don't, don't, be, don't be like those at the end of this passage. Because the word of God came to Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient past where the good way is and walk in and you shall find rest for your souls. But the discouraging part of this passage is the last phrase of verse 16 when the people basically said, nah, <laughs> nah, we're good, we're, we're happy. We're floundering out here, flapping in the wind. We don't have enough power of God on us to have any kind of impact on our community. But we're, we're good. We're actually good with that. God's direction was very clear through the man of God to the people of God. You stand, you ask and you walk, and notice the payoff. You'll find rest. That spiritual revival that you're desperate for, that place to get back where you long to be, and may, may, maybe you've been observing it in someone else's life, maybe you've never been spiritually where you want to be. I think, I think the logic is still sound. If you see something in your mom or your dad or your spouse or someone that you desire to be spiritually where they are, I think the same rules are in place here. You seek after those things of God. You be all that God's called you to be, reading your Bible and, and studying your Bible and praying and, and testifying, telling people about the good news of Jesus. That's the old paths. Subject yourself to good preaching anytime you have the opportunity. Confess and repent of your sins every time God convicts you of it. And then you rest in the favor of a loving God that doesn't want you floundering, hopping around in the wind. He says, you come on home. Come into me, all you that are labor. I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. You'll find rest for your souls. Pretty straightforward. Stand, ask, walk in the old paths, and then rest in the arms of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the privilege that was mine to bring a good word from you. A challenging word. I thank you, Father, that it convicted my heart before I could ever preach it. And, oh, God, I ask you now, Lord, that you'll let it fall on receptive hearts. Fertile ground here this morning is my prayer that we'll leave this place this morning with desiring a closer walk with you and, and, and examining why it is that we do what we do in our, in, our, in our faith walk with you. Go home with us, I pray. Protect us as we travel. Can again, bless these graduates. As they begin to look at the next chapter of their life, I pray your hand of blessing on them in every way. Go home with us, protect us, use us for your glory in all that we say and all that we do. And I'll gladly praise you for it in advance. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.